This ancient settlement proves that people have lived here from time immemorial. Lived. Multiplied. Created. And fought. There are many similar places across Georgia. The excavations have unearthed household, warfare, and industrial artifacts. It isn't hard to guess the function of these objects. The variety of household objects was rather limited for people of that epoch. They had to be content with basic tools and primitive implements. However, it was these tools that have seen mankind through the centuries, guaranteeing their survival. And if these objects cannot boast perfection of shapes and loud brand names, their application is still the same nowadays. Pots and knives and arrowheads have the same function today. It was only in recent history that these industrial tools became the main symbols of the world's largest country. People were always inclined to be different from their fellow tribesmen, to control their physical and intellectual abilities. Thanks to their exceptional oratorical skill, such ambitious individuals easily subjugated others, who readily acknowledged them as chiefs and ascribed a divine status to them. People would go out of their way to praise the chief and win his favor trying to please him in order to guard themselves from his divine wrath. The tradition goes back several millennia. The Maya tribal chief. An Australian Aboriginal chief with his wife the Seminole tribal chief. And the leader of the world proletariat. This person isn't much different from the people around him. He neither has a plumage headwear nor a scepter in his hand but he still turned into the most powerful, the most ambitious leader in the world. As a rule, any chief is an expert in the peculiarities of human traits, being perfectly aware that material welfare is of paramount importance for the majority. Attracted by the idea of class equality, the people follow their leader. The footage needs no comment. Similar events have taken place across the globe and will still happen, unfortunately. War is the least justifiable method of solving problems, while a civil war is the most iniquitous, bringing tragedy to any nation. It is virtually impossible to decide who is right and who is wrong. In cases like these, both sides commit a grave crime against their nation and posterity. Every war entails destruction, of which this footage is clear proof. But these are just bridges, houses, buildings, created by people so they can soon be restored or rebuilt to look even more attractive than before. But it isn't only the burnt down buildings that are left in the aftermath of a war. It is hundreds, thousands or even millions of human lives. But is there on earth any idea or principle that is worth a single human life? Unfortunately, one might well need years to analyze events like these. On the other hand, fortunately, everything comes to an end. The victorious leader celebrates. Soon after these events, a large part of the globe was colored red. Many nations, people of diverse traditions and religious beliefs found themselves under a red cloth, their destinies fatally linked to each other. Red became the dominant color of the communist regime, 
firmly associated with the blood spilt in the quest for freedom, or rather, liberation from the Menshevik oppression. As for freedom itself, the word completely lost its meaning after the revolution. As a rule, the government that comes to power after a revolution attempts to convince society that their struggle was worth every drop of blood spilt and every human life lost in the event. A new life starts with massive rebuilding and reconstruction. Needless to say, nothing worthwhile can be created at such an inhuman pace. But these documentaries became a significant tool for the Soviet regime. An ultimate achievement, Soviet propaganda. A new Soviet ship sailing under a red flag was launched. These people had to leave the ship. There was no room for them on board the Soviet ship. The tidal wave of the revolution washed them overboard, so they were doomed to perish. Such is the progress after several centuries of human evolution. If earlier an impressive bonfire was the sign of respect for the chief, now there is no limit to the forms and ways of praising the leader. It seems impossible to imagine any object or surface without the leader's engraved image. After the fall of the Russian Empire, Georgia declared independence on the 26th of May, 1918. The autocephaly of the Orthodox Church of Georgia was restored. The country began to re-establish its traditional values in secular and religious aspects of life. The independent nation adopted a European model of development as its political choice which absolutely opposed the Bolshevik extremism opted for by Russia. Representatives of European countries frequently visited Georgia to demonstrate their full support for the new government. Starting from that period, the Georgian government attempted to sign peace treaties not only with the European countries, but with its neighbor, Russia, as well. On the 7th of May, 1920, in Moscow, the governments of Georgia and Russia ratified a treaty by which Soviet Russia acknowledged the sovereignty of Georgia within its existing borders. At the time, Soviet Russia was still fighting the remaining generals of the Menshevik government. General Denikin's resistance near the city of Rostov proved particularly hard for the Soviet authorities. Georgi Chicherin, the Russian Foreign Affairs Commissar, wrote to Yevgeny Gigich Kori, the Georgian Foreign Affairs Minister. 
that the Red Army had successfully defeated Generals Yudinich and Kolchak of the former Tsarist Russia, but requested military assistance to fight General Denikin's army. The Commissar assured his Georgian counterpart that such cooperation would be extremely beneficial for Georgia. Minister Gigichkori replied that Georgia had embarked on a democratic path and any military assistance on its part would be deemed to be unacceptable interference in the internal affairs of Russia. His country would never allow its own soldiers to die for the interests of another country. Consequently, Georgia was determined to remain neutral in respect of the domestic problems of its neighbour. It's worth mentioning that at the time there were Soviet governments in Armenia and Azerbaijan, and Georgia was the only country in the Caucasus maintaining its sovereignty. No effort was spared by the Soviet power to remedy such a flaw as various attempts were made to change the existing political situation. The best tool for achieving this was to instigate confrontation inside the country, which wasn't particularly difficult, considering the fact that various ethnic groups lived in different parts of Georgia. In early 1921, the Armenian population of South Georgia started a series of revolts. The well-organized insurgents became permanent and was clearly monitored by Soviet Russia. This seemingly unresolved conflict became the pretext for the Red Army to enter Georgian territory. The Georgian government categorically demanded that the Soviet army leave the sovereign state. Otherwise, Russia's action would be seen as an attempt to occupy Georgia. In reply, Soviet Russia's government explained that they stepped in to protect the Armenian population of Georgia from the aggressive Georgian authorities. Sergo Ojonikidze, the fearless communist based in Baku, controlled the entire process of seizing power in Georgia by the Red Army. Supposedly, Sergo Ojonikidze believed he was rendering enormous service to his home country, not really planning its betrayal. If there were still some people in Georgia who trusted the Soviet Russia's diplomacy not to violate the signed treaty of 1920, they were bitterly disillusioned when the capital city, Tbilisi, was taken over by the Red Army on the 25th of February, 1921. By the end of March, the Red Army had occupied the whole country and established the Soviet regime in Georgia. After Bidisi was taken over by the Red Army, Sergo Ojonikidze proudly wrote from Baku to the Kremlin, to Lenin and Stalin, the red flag flies over Tbilisi. Long live Soviet Georgia. The Georgian communists came to power, forming the so-called Revolutionary Committee with Filipe Makaradze, Mamia Ora Kelashvili, Shalva Eliava, and others. From the Kremlin, Lenin personally corresponded with the members of the Georgian Committee, wholeheartedly congratulating them on the victory and directing their activities towards establishing their control over the whole country. Lenin insisted that the workers should be immediately armed, with the ultimate goal of forming the Georgian Red Army. He also recommended negotiations with the ousted government. Arguably, Lenin's intention was to amass all information related to the strategic plans of the former government and to lay hands on any material treasure that Georgia might have possessed. The majority of the Georgian government succeeded in escaping the perilous situation by emigrating. Those who failed to leave faced fatal consequences in their home country. Immediately on coming to power, the Revolutionary Committee set out to integrate Georgia into the Soviet realm. 
the Georgian railway was linked to that of Russia. The workforce was brought from Rostov to replace the Georgian workers. More than 1,500 churches were closed, profaned and robbed of their religious relics and national treasures. Following the Kremlin's orders, the Georgian communists set out to reallocate the country's territory. The southern part of the Batumi province was given to Turkey. The southern part of Shida Kartli was handed over to Armenia. The historical areas of Sangilo and Eldar were allocated to Azerbaijan. The Russian Federation received the central part of the Caucasian range. In all, these lands amounted to 15,853 square kilometers. Three autonomous republics, Abkhazia, South Ossetia and Achara, were artificially formed, securing easy control of what remained of Georgia. Eager to serve, the Georgian Revolutionary Committee complied with the Kremlin's wishes, publishing new directives practically every day. Georgia was turned into a Soviet state following the Russian model, which contradicted the Georgian national psyche and social structure. There had never been any violent confrontation among the social classes in Georgia, so when the intellectuals, nobility and clerics were presented as the enemies of the nation, it deeply offended all Georgians. As early as the spring of 1921, partisan groups were formed to fight against the Soviet regime. People from all walks of life, hereditary aristocrats as well as the common people, joined these groups. Their aim was to restore the sovereignty of Georgia. The partisans put up formidable resistance to the Red Army in various parts of Georgia. The Soviet authorities were obliged to mobilize a large Red Army contingent from Grozny to combat the Georgian partisans, severing their links with the North Caucasus. A large-scale campaign of arrests and executions started in 1922. Members of the Catholicos Council were arrested in 1923. The Catholicos Patriarch Ambrosi, Chelaya. The Archimandrite Pavle, Chaparidze. Deacon Calistrati Tsinsadze, and many others. They were accused of embezzling church funds. But the true reason was their letter sent to the Genoa International Conference in which the atrocities committed by the Bolsheviks in Georgia were revealed. The letter gave a detailed account of how the historical provinces were handed over to other countries, how the Georgian language, culture and church were ruthlessly persecuted. The appeal to the international community ended with two demands. Firstly, the Soviet Red Army was to leave Georgia immediately and unconditionally. Secondly, the Georgian nation was to be given the opportunity to lead an independent life based on its ethical, religious, cultural and national principles. At the Genoa International Conference, Soviet Russia was represented by Georgi Chicherin, its foreign affairs minister. In response to the Georgian letter, the Russian delegation claimed that it reflected the opinion of a negligible part of Georgian society and that the Soviet regime and all the ensuing reforms were being carried out on the demand of the vast majority. The unlawful intervention of Soviet Russia in the affairs of a sovereign state was harshly criticized by the European countries. But in the end, 
Europe complied with the Soviet request, accepting the Soviet Union as a member of the League of Nations. Obviously, the people's emotions are very different from those read on the faces of Lenin's entourage. They don't seem mournful, more thoughtful, in fact. Stalin might have been thinking about changes, who he would promote or demote, or send into exile, or execute. Or Johnny Kidzi might have wondered what Stalin's thoughts were. Voroshilov's thoughts could have easily been the same. The Soviet people have lost their great leader, guarantor of their happy future, and so they mourn. We are all mortals, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. But is that so? С моей стороны я хотел бы заверить вас, товарищи, что вы можете смело положиться на товарища Сталина. Although Lenin opposed the idea of nominating Stalin as his successor, the latter managed to come to power with the support of his loyal comrades. The Soviet Union has a new leader. Unlike his predecessors, he is less idealistic takes fast decisions and is rather pragmatic. The most dramatic period of the country's history is forever linked to this man. The Soviet Union is still loyal to its priorities. After Stalin came to power, the speed of development doubled. Industrialization was now on a hitherto unseen scale, and Sergo Ochonikidze was appointed head of this strategic sphere. Укажите мне такую крепость, которую бы мы с вами не взяли за эти годы. Таких крепостей нет. Immediately after Lenin's death, a wider insurrection was prepared in Georgia. The plan was agreed. The date was set. According to the plan, BDC was to start a wide-scale strike, which would then involve the entire country. But all the while, the Secret Service was actively working with their informants. Many were arrested for their disloyalty to the Soviet regime. Among them, the rebellion activists, which seriously undermined the uprising and its organizing body. It might well be that the idea of the nationwide insurrection was partially inspired by Lenin's death, as the majority of Georgians believed that the new leader lacked the resources to crush the military resistance, and that he would be confused by the sheer scale of the revolt. But they knew not the nature of the new leader. Unfortunately, they soon discovered how faithful Stalin was to the principles of Marxism-Leninism. The Soviet regime easily defeated the local revolts across Georgia. A small number of the rebels managed to flee the country, but those remaining were either arrested, exiled, or executed. As from the 1930s, an anti-religious campaign gathered momentum. Thousands of party activists were involved in the anti-religious campaign among the common people. In addition, all newspapers and magazines devoted plenty of space to anti-religious pamphlets and caricatures. It became prestigious to combat religion. The old monasteries such as Jvari, Betania and others in the Tbilisi vicinity were given the status of historical and cultural heritage monuments. However, 
the monks and priests in the same places were mercilessly raided by the armed groups organized by the authorities in order to rob the church of its riches. And all the while, the new leader was sure there were still many disloyal people in Georgia who opposed him and his regime. It was for this reason he decided to embark on a new mission of cleansing Georgian society in order to get an ideally subservient population. 1936 marked the start of purges on a gigantic scale headed by Stalin, Molotov, Voroshilov, Khrushchev, Beria and other party leaders. In terms of percentage of those purged, Georgia topped the list among the Soviet republics. In this respect, Beria should be given credit for his enthusiastic work. According to some sources, Beria executed Georgian intellectuals on his own initiative. Some even claim he conducted interrogations, tortured and killed people himself. After all these events, the Soviet regime was truly established in Georgia. Practically, there was no one left to oppose the communist system. The Soviet Union succeeded in breeding an entirely new species, Homo Sovieticus. The most privileged social layer was made of physically well-built people with little or no education. On its part, the Soviet government catered for the spiritual and physical development of its people. Firstly, all the existing cultural centers were closed in order to guard the new Soviet individual from getting alternative food for thought. Precedent of social intolerance was set. The world